Welcome to the 14th Demo Day. Pledge hasn't been here in Seattle in two years. And I get a lot of questions like, where have you been? Well, we've been to five continents. So if you haven't seen the news, Fledge doesn't just run in Seattle now. Fledge runs in a lot of different cities. I've personally been to five continents in the last year. Thank you to my wife and children for indulging me on this. Uh, I've been to five continents spreading Fledge and Fledge-like programs in cities all around the world. Uh, and in fact, Sophia here in the front, front row uh, helps run the Land Accelerator. We're running, that's the next program that's running in Nairobi, Kenya in September. All right, number three. Back to the quiz. We're going to ask you questions. What do you know about startups? What do you know about Seattle startups? What do you know about some other things in general? All right, and specifically, if you notice the camera in the back, there's actually two cameras in the back, which is why you're all squished together. Uh, so this will go out on the internet. And something else that started in the last year is I started a podcast. So in addition to everything else in my life, I put out a weekly podcast, and we're going to put this out on the podcast. As we're going to start out with a little something we've never tried before. We're going to start out with a little quiz. All right, we're going to test your knowledge of startups, and specifically Seattle startups. So who founded Microsoft? Was it Bill Gates Sr., Bill Gates Jr., Bill Gates III? So, Oh, no, no. So who thinks it was senior? Senior. Okay. Who thinks it was junior? Junior. And who thinks it was the third? Third. All right. Awesome. So everyone here is clearly from Seattle. Almost everyone's from Seattle, uh, which is strange because his father goes by senior. His father doesn't go by second. Did anyone know who the second was? Was it, his, was it Bill Gates Sr.? Is that the second? Okay. I'm, I'm looking at Microsoft because they don't know either. All right, so the answer was either junior or the third. I've seen both ways. It's the only one that's going to have multiple answers. Let's try some, something that's a little harder. Okay? So when was Amazon founded? Was it 84, 94, or 04? So who thinks it's 84? Who thinks it's 94? 94. Whoa, who thinks it's 04? Oh, got some young people over here. All right, uh, the answer was it was 94. And 94, all right, so we think the internet's been around forever, right? That just feels like the internet and cell phones and all that have been around forever. The web wasn't invented until 89, and Netscape wasn't founded until 92. So Bezos was pretty quick at getting on this, this internet thing. I think it might be big. All right, um, so in 94, Amazon was a bookstore. Now you can buy anything. Uh, one thing you can buy on Amazon today right now is some BrioTech topical skin care. If you weren't over there at the booth to hear about what that is, you'll hear about it in about 40 minutes. All right, and then you can go buy this today. All right, let's get a little harder. Uh, here's three Seattle startups. At least they were startups. Which one's the oldest? Is it Boeing, Nordstrom, or Costco? So who thinks it's Boeing? Yeah, yeah, hold on. Who thinks it's Boeing? Boeing. Who thinks it's Nordstrom? Nordstrom. Who thinks that's Costco? Wow, this audience is pretty good. All right, so I, I, this one tricked me up when I was researching because it feels like Boeing is older. It feels like Air Flight is older, but I said mute. All right, you can just turn the whole thing off except you got to take pictures. All right, so the answer, of course, as everyone said, is Nordstrom, 1901. It got founded the year before the Wright brothers flew an airplane. All right, three things maybe you don't know about Nordstrom. Who's Wallen? Anybody know who Wallen is? Because Nordstrom didn't have first billing. He got second billing on his own company. Uh, second one is it was a shoe company, right? It's a shoe store. They didn't sell all these other stuff. And in 1901 in Seattle, it was like 80,000, 90,000 people. It wasn't a very big city. Uh, they were certainly not making all the shoes here. The question, which I couldn't find on the internet, is where were the shoes made? Who made the shoes that Nordstrom sold? Who makes the shoes now that Nordstrom sells? Who, in fact, makes the shoes you're wearing right now? Who knows that? Uh, yell out yes if you actually know the answer to that question. Yes. Uh, not very many people. All right, so keep that in your head. You'll hear, you'll hear that question asked again really soon. Let's go the other way. Which of these famous Seattle startups is the newest? Is it Starbucks, REI, or Costco? So who thinks it's Starbucks? Starbucks. Who thinks it's REI? REI. Ooh, I won. Uh, how about Costco? All right, so we're at 50-50. We don't know. And the reason we don't know is because when we hear Starbucks, most of us think Howard Schultz. Howard Schultz didn't start Starbucks. Howard Schultz bought Starbucks. He bought like a 15-year-old company when he bought it because, in fact, the answer is Costco. 
Uh, Starbucks got purchased in the mid 80s, but it's, it dates back to 71. They were not selling coffee as liquid in a cup back then. They were just selling beans. All right, so let's dig into Costco a little bit. They're famous for hot dogs. Anyone ever have a Costco hot dog? Yeah. No, really? All right. All right, and uh, who here has had a Costco rotisserie chicken? I need a yes, right? Yes. Hot dog. Okay, big answer. All right, so uh, the hot dogs are still $1.50. The Costco rotisserie chickens are still $5, $4.99. So how many chickens does Costco sell in a year? Is it $5 million, $20 million, or $60 million? Who thinks it's five? Who thinks it's 20? 20. Who thinks it's 60? 60. All right, yeah, it's 60 million chickens in a year. Costco, if you don't know the specifics, right, they're the second biggest retailer in the world. There's, a, there's not that many Costco's, but they sell a lot of stuff. And last year, they decided to make their own chickens instead of buying them from Tyson. So the stats are crazy. Uh, they're building one facility out west here. It's 400 acres. They're spending $275 million. It will produce 2 million chickens per week. Uh, it's only going to employ 800 people. Keep that in mind, you're going to hear that number or something like it soon. That's only going to produce half the chickens they need. Right? It'll produce enough chickens for the rotisseries, but they sell other chickens as well. Right? So they're going to need another, they're going to need $500 million to just to make the chickens they sell. All right, so let's compare this $60 million number, uh, 60 million number with some other key stats. So this one should be easy. Are there more people in the United States or more chickens sold by Costco? Who thinks the population's higher? than 60? Uh, who thinks it's lower? Good. All right. So it's higher. It's 330 million people. All right. What do you know about Pakistan, though? So is the population of Pakistan higher than 60 million or lower? Who thinks it's higher? Okay. Anyone say lower? Lower. Oh, if you say lower, well, no. You guys are wrong. It's 210 million people. But let's turn up the, turn up the, crank up the difficulty here. Let's go to Kenya. So is Kenya have higher or lower population than 60 million? Who thinks it's higher? Higher. Who thinks it's lower? Lower. Can be more adamant? Yeah, all right. So in this case, it's kind of split. The answer is it's lower. So 49 million people in Kenya. And I'm you know, pulling up these countries. They're not random. You're going to hear from entrepreneurs from these countries. And we're going to hear a lot about chickens. So here's one that doesn't have a right answer. I don't have the right answer, at least, which is how many chickens do you eat in a year? My family, we're Costco members. I think we buy about 30 Costco chickens in a year, at least. There's five of us usually at home. So that's six chickens a piece, just Costco rotisserie chickens that we consume, and that's not all the chicken we eat. So uh, on a, I'll count to three. Just yell out what number you think and how many chickens you think you eat in a year. Ready? One, two, three. Zero. I, heard, I got heard once one vegan in the front. That was pretty loud. Um, besides that, I heard some pretty big numbers. So the question is, all right, and the question is, who sells more chicken? Costco, just rotisserie chicken, or the whole country of Kenya? So who thinks it's Costco? And who thinks it's, the, well, remember, it's 49 million people. Who thinks it's Kenya? Kenya. All right, good. So it's like 40, 60 there. And the answer is surprising. This is where our American intuition breaks down, right? Because the answer is Costco by 10 million chickens. So there's only 50 million chickens sold in Kenya per year, which means about one chicken per person, which means there's malnutrition happening in, in Kenya, right? There just simply isn't enough protein being eaten. Sorry for the vegan, but um, uh, she'll, she'll argue with me later. All right, uh, let's go back to population a second. Uh, the country to the left of Kenya is Uganda. Uh, it's a little bit smaller, but it's a lot wetter. Kenya's a little dry. So population again, uh, who thinks population is bigger in Uganda? Yes. Who thinks it's bigger in Kenya? Kenya? All right, let's try that again. Let's get everyone to, you, it's 50-50 chance. Uganda? <laughs> Kenya. 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 There you go, all right, good, good answer, but not by much. The answer is 44 to 49, right? Your intuition, again, gets, gets broken by sizes of, of states, right? We're in a giant state here. Washington's pretty big, but we only get 8 million people. We have fewer people in Washington than New Jersey. All right, let's try two more. Um, 
our, our last bit of population here, Kenya and Botswana. And again, I'm not pulling these out randomly. You're going to hear from Botswana as well. Uh, they're almost the same size. You look them up, and, and their area is just about the same and is, in fact, the same as Minnesota. All right, so which has a bigger population, Kenya or Botswana? Who thinks it's Kenya? Kenya. Botswana. 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 Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, but it is, in fact, Kenya by a lot. Minnesota is only 5 million people. Uh, Kenya's 49, again, we already saw that. Botswana is only 2.5 million people. Uh, and the reason why it's so small is it's almost all desert. Um, it's way down there. The Kalahari Desert is in Botswana. Uh, but what I didn't ask here is you'll find more elephants in Botswana than you will in Kenya. Uh, there's elephants all over the place, but that's where you'll find the most elephants in the entire world surrounded by a random border drawn by Europeans. All right. Um, <laughs> So that's our little bit of quiz, just to warm you up. And I don't bring this up just for its fun, just, just because it's educational. Also to bring up the point that I keep calling these guys startups, right? And Nordstrom's is 120 years old, and Boeing's 100 and something years old. But we know who started them. They used to be one store selling shoes. They used to be one small red barn making airplanes by hand. Uh, used to be a place that wouldn't even sell you a cup of coffee and so forth. And then they grew up to be big, established public companies. And that's the point of startups. That's what makes Seattle different than, let's say, the California version of startups, where the celebratory act in California is you sold your company to another company and it's gone. The celebratory act here in Seattle is that 100 years later, everyone has heard of your company. It's still selling. It's still making a profit. It's still doing its work. And so with that, I'm going to show you six companies that are not quite there yet, not even close, but hopefully some of these companies in 100 years will be household names in Africa or in the US or in Pakistan uh, or elsewhere in the world. Right? And with that, I'll give you the Fledge 14 fledglings. As a child in Pakistan, Vakas was forced to work in a brick factory. He eventually made his way out, learning how to handcraft beautiful shoes, but selling them in the local markets was not enough to earn a living or feed his family. Jamila is a 52-year-old embroidery artist. When she lost her husband, she took over his embroidery business. But it's not easy running a business as a woman in Pakistan. If you are a craftsperson in Pakistan selling shoes in the local markets, you earn $50 a month, which is not even half the minimum wage. Running an embroidery business in a good month, you might make that minimum wage, but still not a livable wage. The problem is that artisans like Vakas and Jamila can compete with mass-produced goods in the local markets and have no access to sell in the global markets. Now, with growing consumer awareness and demand for transparency in the global markets, my partner and I saw this as a problem worth solving. So, two years ago, we gathered a handful of these artisans in Pakistan and began manufacturing handcrafted women's ballet flats. I am Afsha, CEO and co-founder at Fuchsia Shoes, we connect artisans to consumers who want to buy beautiful, comfortable, and sustainably made fashion. This is not a one-way connection. We're not selling shoes Vakas was making before we met him. Nor the embroidery designs Jamila has been sewing for years. But we improved on the traditional designs to ensure they meet the quality needs of our American consumers. We added rubber soles, soft padding to the footbed that adds comfort in our shoes and improve the overall durability and functionality uh, of the shoes. Between increased demands of our shoes and improved product quality, our artisans now make $300 a month, which may not sound like a lot of money, but it is three times the minimum wage for workers in their communities and very much a livable wage. We let our artisans focus on making stellar products, something they're inherently good at. 
While our team in Seattle focuses on trends in fabric patterns, researching fabric patterns, product designs, marketing, sales, shipping, and customer service. In the last 18 months, we have 7,000 customers, all exclusively through sales on our website, selling in United States and Canada. Our customers love us, as we have been doubling our repeat customer rate every six months, now at 16%. The key driver to this is the fact that they now know who makes their shoes. We provide them information around how we source our raw material or process what was the process behind putting each and every pair together. There's a clear and rising trend in the fashion industry today to know where your product comes from. And by building sustainability and transparency into our brand's DNA, we are using it as a differentiator in our overall storytelling and marketing strategy. And with growing consumer awareness, we believe that transparency is the only way forward. My co-founder, Ramiz, and I bring over a decade of experience working for some of the leading tech companies in the world. We are also originally from Pakistan, a country with tremendous growth in the manufacturing sector space. And we have built an exceptional team with the right mix of fashion, tech, and retail to pull this off. Now, with our current growth rate, by 2020, we will hit a million dollars in annual revenues. But we want to grow faster, which is why we are here at Fledge. We want to onboard at least 2,000 artisans across South Asia and South America and offer a wide variety in our shoes and other fashion accessories, like scarves, jewelry, tote bags. So if you want a piece of the $30 billion footwear industry while helping or changing lives for underprivileged artisans for a better future, come and find me. Thank you. Three years ago, I visited them at their offices because I used to have a passion for uh, poultry keeping. They trained me and uh, they helped me set up uh, a structure for 100 chicks in Migosi Estate in Kisumu. I worked with them subsequently until I, I can now um, keep 1,000 chicks comfortably. I keep broilers for meat, and I keep uh, uh, kenyeji for eggs and uh, meat also. It's just a full-time job. I don't have any other work. I just do the chicken work. They have worked with me throughout the process, and today they are purchasing my chicken, you know? So I'm assured of a market. It's not something I have to struggle to look for and walk around. Uh, poultry is pain, and uh, poultry is a good business. And uh, you just need to have the right information about the quality, the input, the, the management process, production, and where to take the, the, the where to take your parts when you are sure. Ten million people, four hundred thousand chickens. Every day in Western Kenya, ten million people consume 400,000 chickens. And this is going to double in the next 10 years. Due to urbanization, population growth, and economic growth. Sadly, only 30% of this is locally produced. 70% is imported from other regions. The people are unable to produce their own chicken due to lack of inputs, information and training on poultry management, market access for their grown chicken. Four years ago, I saw this opportunity. I quit my job at the hospital to set up a profitable business that will empower the people to rear their own chicken. My business model is a two-stop shop. 
Number one, we provide free training and veterinarian care services to poultry farmers who buy our chicks, feeds, and the medications. Number two, we buy back all the grown chicken, we process, we sell to hotels, restaurants, and the local households. To date, the company has grown with 25 full-time employees and 500 previously unemployed women and youths currently rearing chickens for us. With a sale of 300 chickens daily, we are the largest producers in the region. Our goal is to scale up our production from 300 chickens to 3,000 chickens daily. To do this, we are raising 300,000 US dollars. This will go into one, setting up a processing and slaughter facility, two, setting up a cold storage facility, and three, buying of trucks for collection and delivery of chicken. My name is Abisai Nandi. I'm the founder and CEO of Chicken Basket. Join me in this journey as I empower more people and change lives in Kenya. Thank you. In the year 2000, I moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota to expand my business. 12 years later, I decided to return back home to Kisi in Western Kenya, a rural community. In Kisi, I teamed up with Kisi University, a public school with 16,000 students, a large school, not in the same league like the University of Washington. Last week, I took a tour of our department which takes ideas and research in the university, convert them into startups. It was a large place, employing over 200 employees. It took me a half a day to go through the department. Back in Kisi University, we do the same thing, but in a very tiny scale. I am the old department, which turns ideas into business. The university students of Kisi and the entire community, they come to us with hundreds of ideas, good ideas, but we are able for the last three years to turn only three into business. The first is the manufacturing of soap. The second, the manufacturing of briquettes. And the third, the manufacturing of animal feed. The key word is manufacturing. Manufacturing because in Western Kenya, manufacturing has been slow to come by. The reason for that slow is because there's no reliable electricity. One of my students, Sarah, as was coming to school every day in the college, one day she came across in our mind, for the first time, it rang that there was a waterfall by the town of Ogembo where she passed as she came to school. When the idea in our, heart, in our mind was to make electricity, she urgently came to my office and asked this question. Can we use that waterfall to make the electricity? My answer was yes. It is done all over the world, tens of thousands of times. Yes, we can do it. With the blessings of the university, we got 12 teams. Each team was given a river to mark. Three months later, they had identified over 5,000 waterfalls, all of them with the potential to make electricity. What can we do? We found that this is easily done using a simple technology going on top of the waterfall. Take a pipe, divert a little water, put it in the pipe, bring it in the pipe down on the waterfall, and then put the water out through the turbine, hydro, micro-hydro turbine, release the water back to the river. 
in the process, use that energy to generate electricity. The technology is proven technology. All the equipment, all the parts are materials we buy off the shelf. In the town of Ogembo, we are Sarah Hard the first epiphany. The first power plant would produce half a megawatt. If we use all the 10 waterfalls shared by the town, more than enough electricity for the town of 50,000 people. To achieve this, we are raising 200,000. In our projections, with the current price of electricity in Kenya of 22 cents, we will be able to break even within the first one year. After we make this electricity in Ogembo, we intend to make it over and over in every river in the region, which covers 100 million people who live without electricity, and yet they are covered with hundreds of megawatts of power and tapped renewable energy, carbon-free energy. My name is Elias Mabiria. I'm a co-founder of Viera Energy, the company ready to provide power using the resources available in Western Kenya to power the rural Kenya. Thank you so much. For three months each year, many families set up home alongside their field, far from the security of the village. On one side, millet. On the other, the wilderness of the eastern panhandle of the Okavango Delta. The period of harvest coincides with the movement of some 15,000 free-roaming elephants in the region. Farmers are on high alert. A single elephant can deplete a family source of food for an entire year. This is a very real conflict. A fight for survival for both people and elephants. Handle of the Okavango is sparsely populated and remote, but with almost one elephant for every person, conflicts are inevitable. If you are a farmer in my country, that could have been your farm. Botswana is home to the world's largest elephant population, and every year farmers lose their crops to the elephants. Elsewhere in Africa, the solution is to shoot the elephants. But in Botswana, we have a better, more natural solution, bees. How is that possible? It's simple. Elephants don't like bees, especially when they go into their nostrils. So we therefore put beehives around the farm as farm fences. Using bees, we currently employ more than 300 women farmers in my community. We help with food security as farmers are now able to harvest their crops. We also help conserve wildlife as farmers no longer have to shoot elephants. We have seen the decline in numbers of gender-based violence as women now have jobs and are empowered. And lastly, the bees get to pollinate the farmers' crops as well as plants in the ecosystem. Uh, we currently supply our honey in Botswana through our distributors. And over the past 14 months, we have reached a turnover of more than $250,000 in honey sales. Our honey is supplied in pharmacies for medicinal purposes, in supermarkets, in restaurants, as well as hotels in Botswana. Plus, we export to two of the neighboring countries, Lesotho and Namibia. 
We are currently raising $150,000, which will enable us to grow our farmer network to 1,000 farmers, as well as expand on our production factory. With that, we hope to be able to reach a turnover of more than 1 million US dollars in the next two years. My name is Mavis Ndwicha, CEO and founder of Kalahari Honey. Join me as I change the world one bee at a time. Thank you. As a young child, I was privileged to be born by a rich man. But when he died in 2001, I ended up being raised a poor woman's son. A single mother who tried her best for a better future for her son and her children. But my father's relatives grabbed all his properties and sold them off, leaving us, the deceased children, with nothing. But life wasn't really bad. Thanks to the chicken and their eggs. When a chicken says, bok, 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 <laughs> it means, hey, buddy, I have got eggs in me. Or sometimes, bok, 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 means, hey, I have got more than eggs to feed you. I have got protein, nutrients, and more in me to feed you, your family, and your community. I learned how to talk chicken growing up. My mother raised chicken and eggs, and her chicken and eggs paid for food, school, health care. Chicken and eggs sent me to college. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Ore Oscar Daniel, the founder of Ore eggs. Ore means home in my language. Lango. It's a language commonly spoken in the eastern part of Uganda. Three years ago, I founded Ore eggs with only 10 chicken. Today, I am happy to tell you that we have a flock of 6,000 chickens organically raised without any antibiotics using aloe vera, a plant rich in minerals, vitamins, and enzymes that promote overall good health to our chicken. Our chickens lay 3,000 eggs per day that we sell to hundreds of local farmers, helping them generate an income and saving their children and their customers' children from being malnourished. We also hatch 4,000 day-old chicks every week that we supply to the local farmers so that they can make more money and feed more children. In the last three years, we have been able to produce 80,000 day old chicks and 6 million nutritious eggs. My goal is to increase production to tens of thousands of retailers and 10,000 farmers. The only block on our way is funding. We are looking into raising 125,000 US dollars. With this, we shall be able to triple the production of eggs and double the production of day-old chicks. Please join me in seeing this a success. May God bless you all, and may God bless this United States of America. Healthcare is in a global crisis. Superbugs, rising costs, pandemics. We're living in the final glory days of antibiotics, where for just a little, little while longer, a bout of pink eye or an infection is nothing more than an inconvenience. But six years ago, Dr. Margaret Chan, Director General of World Health, 
warned us all, first and second level antibiotics have now failed and we face the specter of a future where people will once again begin to die from common infections. These daily stories are all around us. Hospital acquired infections, non-healing wounds, the spread of Ebola, and it seems healthcare costs rise as fast as new pathogens begin to develop. What do you do? The disruptive solution to these problems is actually found in nature. There's a little molecule called hypochlorous acid, or HOCl, and you make it in your own body. It's been around for hundreds of millions of years. We make this as the natural systemic response in defense in your own white blood cells. So does your dog, so does your cat, so does a fish, and those annoying houseflies. In fact, all life makes this molecule as part of its defense and healing process. Here's a molecule that should be used in every first aid kit, should be in every hospital and every clinic. The primary reason is this molecule is wildly unstable. Even when you make it in your own white blood cells, it lasts only seconds. If used in hospitals, they make it right next to the bed so that they can apply it instantly before it breaks down. That works, but that's inconvenient, it's expensive, and it's untenable. Well, when we learned about this molecule, we realized we had an advantage. You see, we saw the problem wasn't with chemistry and biology and physics. In fact, a lot of companies try to make this molecule today using standard chemistry. We realized this was a manufacturing problem. Well, it so happens my background for 40 years has been developing disruptive manufacturing solutions. And we saw what could be achieved with this molecule in global health. And we set out to solve this problem as a mission-driven company. Change the discussion of health, healing, and disinfection around the world. After a lot of research, we solved the problem. And we built scalable processes to produce this uniquely pure, safe, and potent molecule. This natural molecule out of only salt water. Our molecule, Brio HOCL, is a liquid solution used topically. It is stable when it's frozen or scalding. It's stable and safe as a fog or a spray. And it's stable and pure in a bottle for years and years. Well, this breakthrough offers for the first time real and effective low-cost options to wound care and addressing antibiotic resistance and pandemics globally with the ability to deliver this wherever it's needed. Our stability offers a potency that has been published by National Institute of Health as unprecedented. Imagine that this is a natural molecule that is both an immune booster and a sterilant. It is hundreds of times more potent than bleach, but you can spray it in your eyes and spray it on a baby's rash or drink it. We have shipped to thousands of cities across America. We have donated to dozens of countries in disaster relief. We invite you to come visit us in our factory in Woodenville, Washington, where we make this by the ton with a vision to change the realities of global health. I'm Dan Terry. We're BrioTech, the world's leader in HOCL, bottling nature's solution for healing and disinfection. All right, one last question of the night. This one doesn't have an answer, which is which one was your favorite?
uh, Costco chickens are one of the six you heard of, uh, or the seventh is on the list that you haven't heard of yet. So let me tell you a little bit about that one. That's called Africa Eats. It's my plan. Uh, and again, going back to what I started with today, the question was, which of these companies or companies like them are going to be the big established uh, giant companies in 100 years? And we don't know, right? But again, that's the goal. The goal is not to flip these companies. It's to have real impact in at least a whole country, if not a whole region, if not a whole continent. So let's jump over to Africa, right? You saw four companies from Africa present today, three of them in agriculture. Well, it turns out that Fledge has done a lot of work in Africa in agriculture. We have 20 graduates who all work with smallholder farmers. They're in nine, 10 different countries. It's on the map up there. Uh, what they have in common is that like chicken basket or Ore eggs, they don't just help themselves. They're not just trying to be the next Tyson chicken. They're trying to actually uh, improve incomes for the whole community so that more people can afford and uh, afford everything, not just to eat. All right, so the plan is to take those companies, wrap them in a holding company, add 10 million in growth capital, and make them much bigger. So 10 million to start with. These companies collectively in 2018 did over $3 million in revenue, worked with something like 30,000 farmers collectively. Collectively, they're something of substance. They're, they're, they're big, right? They're, they're worthy of attention of institutions. Individually, they're still small. But what we think is given 10 million in capital and a few years of growth, we'll be big enough to go public with this entity. And then we'll take that money and we'll get them bigger and bigger and bigger and add more companies in and so forth until within five or 10 years, we have something that not only has a big impact across the continent feeding a billion people, but also is then an investment that any of you can make because it's a public company. And you can then invest in the growth of Africa which is something we didn't have when China pulled a half a billion people out of poverty. There was no company you could really invest in that had that, had that reach. Same thing in India. There's 450 million middle class in India now, but none of us have anything in our stock portfolio that's helping grow that, that growth. And so the goal here is to do this in Africa where we can take our capital. We have all the capital. They have all the poor people. We need to bring the capital to the poor people. That's how you fix this problem. And so that's the goal. That's, that's what Africa Eats is about. All right. So with that, uh, I'll thank the mentors. I see a lot of them in the audience here. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for working with these teams. This program doesn't work without you, right? So without all your time, then the, all I get is me. Just me is not enough. Uh, also, a big thanks to Impact Hub Seattle. This is our home. We've been here for seven years. It's a great place because not only is this the place that everyone wants to come to, but random people will come and be mentors that didn't know they were gonna be mentors that day. They just show up and they get pulled over and the next thing you know, they're sitting down and they're working on a website together or, or whatnot. And with that, I'll leave you to have conversations with the fledgling. Mm -hmm.